forward. So um, we also have the forward-looking statement. Um, real briefly, we're neural stem cells. Now, these are fetal-derived cells. So you can think roughly eight-week gestational age. Um, one of the other differences is that our cells are regionally specific. So there isn't one neural stem cell that we have that we can put into a patient and it turns into the right type of cell. We grow cells from the midbrain or from the spinal cord or from the hippocampus, um, and they become those cells. One of the other differences um, that we sort of focus on in our programs is that the cells are what we call physiologically relevant um, in dishes, in vitro. So that's why the company really is sort of divided into two halves. We have the therapeutic side of the company, which is transplanting these cells into patients, and then we had about two and a half million dollars from the Defense Department to use the hippocampal cells actually in dishes to discover uh, a new class of drugs, which I'll talk about, which are now in patients uh, to treat major depressive disorder. Um, the other thing I would point out at this point is that these cells are not immortal, uh, but they have a mitotic capacity, that's an ability to double, of about 60 doublings. So that's a billion, billion fold expansion. And so for instance, the spinal cord cells that we now have in humans in ALS, um, we have an FDA approved cell bank you know, for use in clinical trials. And we'll be able to transplant literally millions of patients from a single donated tissue from that um, GMP uh, cell bank. Uh, as a business proposition, what we decided to do on the therapeutic side was to go after indications that we could use the same cells, the spinal cord cells for, rather than, for instance, Parkinson's with the midbrain cells, which is how we produce dopaminergic neurons, to leverage the safety, the human safety data that we create with the, um, with the surgeries. So, again, this is just sort of a, a brief thing we go into two places. And I would tell you right now, in terms of uh, resources, both human resources and capital, it's about 50-50 between the small molecule program and the, uh, and the cell therapy program. We have one ongoing trial in each. Uh, I'm going to talk about the ALS trial down at Emory in Atlanta, which is the cell therapy first, and then the, um, the depression trial. This will give you a feel for who's involved in the ALS trial. Uh, Eva Feldman at the Taubman Institute at Michigan is our overall PI, and uh, John Glass is the site PI down at Emory. Nick Boulis from uh, Cleveland Clinic, who's now at Emory, is our surgeon. Nick is also the inventor of the device that we use, which we've licensed uh, from the Cleveland Clinic, and we're now out licensing. These are the people involved in helping the trial advisory board um, to design the trial. And this is particularly important in ALS because there's about 30,000 ALS patients in the U.S at any one time. On average, they die about three to five years from diagnosis, so that number stays kind of stable. About five to 6,000 new diagnoses a year. And a lot of the patients don't go to doctors because there's nothing. There's really no treatment for them, nothing that helps their symptoms, nothing that extends their life, and nothing that improves their quality of life. And because of that, it, it's not easy to really understand how to help these patients. And, and by having all these guys, everybody you see here are clinicians who basically have the largest ALS clinics in the U.S. And that means in the world, by the way. Um, and so John has about 400 patients now in his clinic in Atlanta, and Eva has about 240. Um, you know, Hirozi has a similar size in New York. Zach's at Hershey in uh, Pennsylvania. And so these are the way that, these are the doctors who can tell you, well, this is what we see, and this is really how we think you need to to help these patients and how to measure that. So they helped design the trial, and, and these guys are on the data safety monitoring board also. It includes, by the way, Lucy Brugin, who's the chief scientist for, the, for ALSA. Um, I'm going to, if this will work, actually show you the surgery. So we're actually, I don't know if I can pause this or not. Um, can we pause that? Nope. Well, the surgery, as you can see, is a targeted surgery, actually into the gray matter of the spinal cord. Um, I'm not, don't think I'm doing that. You can see them opening it up here. It'll slow down when we get to the film of the, the surgery. Um, okay, you can go forward now if you're, if you're pausing it. Um, now, ah, let's just let it run. Don't worry about trying to pause it. 
Okay, um, so basically what we're doing here is you'll see a device. We're actually going through the back and the spinal cord. This is targeted into the lumbar area. The FDA is required that we only do lumbar surgeries for the first 12 patients, and then we're moving into the uh, cervical area, and we have actually transplanted the 13th patient in the cervical area. The device, which you're about to see, um, that was developed by Nick Bolas, was developed really to address two issues. One, the spinal cord moves a little, and here you're seeing the actual surgery. So here's the floating cannula actually in the human spinal cord. Um, okay. Not quite sure why that's happening. But um, what we basically did is half the patients got five injections, half got ten. So there's a little bit of a dose escalation. There's 100,000 cells per injection. So they got half a million or a million cells, um, all in the lumbar area. And our cells don't migrate in the spinal cord. So the cells have been shown, they, they go in, they integrate, they actually synaptically integrate, and they stay put. And it's a, what we assume is a long surviving graft. In animals, the grafts survive as long as we can keep the animals alive. Um, I don't think I'm doing that, but uh, we'll try one more time. Are you doing that back there, or am I? OK. Um, so the data, which we'll get to in a minute, was presented by Eva Feldman, who is now the president of the ANA, um, in September on the first 12 patients. So these are the patients that got only lumbar injections. And you don't have to speed it up. Just, just let it run. Um, basically, the take-home message from Eva was that um, the, the, you can think of the patients, by the way, as split into two groups, sort of late-stage patients and then earlier-stage patients. Um, and we saw really very encouraging signs of clear biological activity, survival of the cells, and efficacy. Um, again, well, I don't know who's doing that, but the, um, the, the patients who are getting lumbar injections, you'd only assume are going to have an effect in the lower extremities. Um, this is all. You can go to our website, neuralstem.com, and actually be able to read it. This was presented only about six months after the last surgery. But basically, um, what, what we saw was that in all but two of the patients, um, we bring the patients in three months prior to surgery. So we sort of create the metrics that we're measuring as a slope going into the trial as well as after. And in all but two of the patients in the lower extremities, um, the patients either leveled off or improved uh, over time. We have patients now over two years out. And of course, one of the patients, a guy named Ted Harada, was in Newsweek and was on CNN, who's had sort of a remarkable recovery. And Ted went from not being able to walk across the room with help to just finishing the two and a half mile ALS walk down in Atlanta recently. Um, so we're, we're very encouraged. As Martin said, you know, when you do a cell therapy study, there are no healthy volunteers. These are the real patients. Now, we're only been able to put, at the FDA's insistence, 25% uh, of the amount of cells that we think we need to put in. And so we're seeing these very encouraging signs um, with a very, very small amount of cells. We are working with the FDA now to try and accelerate the trial uh, since it's clear that the safety profile is excellent. You saw the beginning of that um, trial. It looks fairly um, invasive. Obviously, there's a little bit of a, there's a laminectomy. The fact is when we originally budgeted this trial, we thought the patients would be in an ICU unit for a week and then a step-down unit for another week. All of the patients have gone home after three days. Uh, so, so the surgery is working as well as we could have hoped. Um, we're seeing very encouraging signs of, uh, you know, function. And, um, but what we do see is that even in those patients, their breathing continues to deteriorate. So ALS patients die because eventually the muscles that control breathing and swallowing atrophy, and they swallow their own saliva and die or they suffocate. And so even if their legs get better and their function gets better, if your breathing doesn't get better, it doesn't help you. And so the second six patients after the first 12 we did for the original approved protocol were to get um, cervical injections in the upper area near the neck um, because that's where you can put cells that can help the muscles that control breathing and swallowing. We transplanted the first patient uh, in that. That's a six-person uh, cohort. And again, it's 
Three of them will get five injections. Three will get ten. Uh, and he also left after three days, so I can report that, that it, it appears as though the, the cervical injections will work just as smoothly as the, the lumbar injections. Um, that's the area where if we see the same biological activity and the same sort of effect on function, we can really help the patient's quality of life and, and extend that life. So that's what we're focused on with ALS. Um, you know, I, we have some other programs where we'll be using the same cells, the same device, spinal cord injury. Um, we're actually going to be starting a trial to treat um, motor disorder, chronic motor disorder from stroke with the same cells. But, but for right now, just I'll focus on this. Yes. So the other thing is um, we are now getting ready to go into a 1B. We've had FDA approval uh, for our small molecule drug, NS189, which treats um, – this was developed with $2.5 million from the Defense Department, um, and it is a first-in-class neuroregenerative drug. Again, if you remember, we could grow hippocampal neurons. The hippocampus is the only area in the adult brain where there are endogenous neural stem cells. You have, in essence, substitutes coming off the bench. There are a number of diseases where hippocampal degeneration is now uh, implicated, among them all the psychiatric diseases. Uh, Maruzio Fava, who runs the Harvard Clinical Trial Network, has designed our uh, trials, and he'll actually run the phase two. Um, as I said, we did a uh, healthy volunteer trial um, that was done. We've had approval, and we will probably start next month in the actual depressed patients, 28-day uh, dosing, three different cohorts. Um, the only thing else I'll say about this is that we have publicly said that we're um, going to be partnering this out early uh, in Japan, uh, an exclusive deal just for the Japanese market. And the goal of the company is to hang on to the worldwide rights outside of Japan until the uh, Phase two data comes in. And that's uh, the story. Thank you.